57 of History with James. This is the screen capture version, and which will be converted into the audio version for the podcast later on. I'm just showing you the podcast page right now, um, History with James. So if you were to find it, you can go. We'll go back to the front page, and we'll go like this. We'll search in the search bar up here, and there's that. So that will once you search the search button, you go down to the podcast section here, and the first one there is History with James. And if you wanted to rate and review, you could do that. You could write a review by clicking this button here. You can also click to rate using that section there. Um, so anyway, today's podcast is called um, The Origin. Well, this is the screen capture, but it will be converted to a podcast, so we can say that too. Um, right. So it's called The Origin of the Racial State. And in the introduction, Germany and the Germans in Eastern Europe. The history of the Germans in Eastern Europe goes back to the Middle Ages and the Crusades. Henry the Fowler, king of Germany in the 10th century, so Henry Fowler. See if it has, I guess this is a picture. Right? King of Saxony, as it says here. Uh, Henry the Fowler, King of Germany in the 10th century, fought with the Slavs in Eastern Europe. Again, the people, again, the Slavs uh, are the people of Eastern Europe who share a common language, culture, and sometimes religion, depending, but religion does differ among Slav groups. As German historian Peter Wendt wrote of the German movement to the east. This was the result of what has been called the medieval colonization of the east. The, slow, uh, the slow but steady expansion of the German-speaking peoples into Slav territory, mainly in the course of the 12th and 13th centuries. So roughly um, the 1100s to the 1200s. While these expansions initially took place um, took place of a, uh, on conflict and campaign realm. Later on, Slav rulers promoted immigration of German settlers east. Okay, so among these, um, among these, right, among these were artisans and farmers. Right, so the uh, Slavic rulers actually promoted German immigration east. It is, in the, uh, it is important to explain this before we move forward because um, we need to explain the long contact of Germans and the Slavic peoples. So Prussia and Eastern Europe. In the 18th, uh, 18th and for at least 200 years after, Germany was fragmented among um, states. As German historian Peter Van wrote, instead there were numerous states with Austria, Prussia, Saxony, Hanover, and Bavaria among them, never united, um, seldom collaborating, but most of the time competing for recognition as powers of, of European standing. One of those states that would become a European... Um, well, actually, let's give you a good map of the... Uh, before we begin. And then, of course, you can look these things up if you're listening to the podcast version. Um... Let's just go 18th century. This is what Germany used to look like. Okay, so this is what Germany used to look like here. You have the different seas. Bavaria, um, Kingdom of Saxony, Prussia, okay, uh, Hanover. As you can see there's Austria, Bavaria, this is Wittenberg, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, so yeah, you can see there's other maps too. If you want to look them up, you can look at kingdoms of, or states of Germany, 18th century, and you'll find some pretty useful maps. Let's see here. We can see if we can find some better ones. And sometimes these boundaries weren't exactly clear either. Uh, this one's kind of... Uh, that one's very fragmented. So anyway, you get the point of that. 
one of the uh, one of the studs that was become a European power and had major uh, contact with Eastern Europe was Prussia. So we can actually show you a map of Prussia. Uh, you can type in Prussian expansion if you'd like to follow along with that. Alright, so that's actually a pretty good map here. The original Prussian state. Um, you can see, you can type in expansion of Prussia 1807 to 1871. Okay, so that's one of the one of those uh, states that was uh, become a European power and have major contact with Eastern Europe was Prussia. Okay, so the uh, while the uh, while we discussed heavily the formation of the German state in 1870 on a podcast episode entitled Germany Splintered to United, uh, which is available for download if you would like to listen, I will refresh on Prussia. So if you'd like to look at it, you can go to our podcast section here, and now let's see what episode that was. There it is, Splinter to United, uh, be number nine on the list. It's about a 40-minute podcast if you'd like to listen to that. But again, because it's a totally different podcast, we'll briefly go over some of the things. Prussia was established in 1701, uh, one would become the most powerful German state other than Austria, but eventually even passing Austria. Prussia was an upstart that really did come out of nowhere because it was such a small state, 13th in terms of population in Europe, um, Prussia had to rely on a militarized state. In 1740, with the 10th largest, uh, in 1740 it had the 10th largest military in Europe, or no, the 10th largest territory in, the, in Europe, uh, Prussia maintained an army that was third or fourth largest to its neighbors. So the, you can really see the expansion if you look at the map. If you were to pull up the map, you can see a lot of um, expansion. You know, beginning in 1807, then 1815, right? And then um, you can go, you know, territory gained from uh, Den Denmark and, Aust and Austria, which is further down, and then right. But if you were to look at another map. See if we can find a better one. All right here's actually a pretty good one. If you can make this a full size. So you can kind of see here on the map, you know, Brandenburg is the original state in 1618. Gaines in 1640. This purple color here, if you look at the map, you can look it up. If you're watching the screenshot, you'll see where I'm pointing with the mouse. And then uh, further. So you just see a lot of expansion, and then eventually they get, you know, places in place like Prussia, or East Prussia as they called it, which is part of Poland, and, right, so it maintained a really large army, because it was such a small state. As historian Hagen Schultz wrote on the reasoning for such a military state, this decision uh, accounts for the disproportionate emphasis on the military in the Prussian state, and its bureaucratic organization of all aspects of life, so that e Every last resource could be mobilized in case of its need. Um, you, when you have a small state, you have to be able to stand up to uh, neighbors, because neighbors can really easily roll over you, and that's why you have to have, uh, you know, such a large. <clears throat> why you have to have such a large um, state, right? Makes sense to a lot of people. Okay, so Prussia life centered on the ability to mobilize the society in defense. From much larger states, as we talked about. Um, the young upstart would grow tremendously. Would grow tremendously in its first hundred years, taking over most of northern uh, Germany. Among this growth came the accusations of uh, acquisitions of Poland by the partitions of 1772, 1793 and 1795. So you can look that up right now. I'm actually going to pull that up for you. Uh, let's see if we got a good one here. Uh, 
Hmm? Well, I don't know if you can really see this one. Alright, so if you pull up a map, there'll be, uh, you know, you can look at different ones. Here's one if you're just watching the screen capture. Um, so you have Austria in the south here, King of Galicia, or and right, so this is Austria. And then uh, Prussia, what they called East Prussia. And some West, Western Prussia as well. And uh, Russia, let's see if we can find the Russian, yeah, Russian color here, Ruthia, I think. Ruthenia, 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 I think is how you pronounce it, and that's the part, you know, closest to Russia, and then the part in purple, a darker purple, is also another partition that happened, so you can see where the Poland is divided up, so basically, Prussia becomes a uh, uh, Eastern European power, right, as we're looking at the partition. And so, yeah, we can see that, right? These three partitions were gradually, um, you know, you get three different, um, you get three different states in Poland, in the former territory of Poland, right? So, some, you know, this may be another one here. This may be one of the earlier ones. This is the second partition. So, eventually, this so called independent part of Poland is gone uh, very shortly in the last partition. If you're looking at the map, if you pull up a few maps, um, the the partition had been achieved with the help of Russia, who was one of the three parties involved in the partition. The others being the Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? So Russia, uh, Russia, Prussia, and um, at this time it was probably more Austria. They didn't become Austria-Hungary till um, they didn't become Austria-Hungary till uh, about. 1860s. So at this time it was known as Austria. With the acquisition, a big portion of the population of the kingdom now uh, was in Eastern Europe. So, you know, Prussia had to have contact with Eastern Europe, right? As you can see, you know, um, if you're looking at the map, Prussia and what is Poland, which are Eastern European peoples, right? And let's see if we can pull up another map here. Some, another way of putting it is like this, the Habsburg Empire in the south, if you're looking at the map, 1795, this is what, eventually what it looks like, you can look up 1795 partition of Poland, if you're listening, or you can just kind of follow along, you don't have to follow any of the stuff we're talking about, see, you get the upper portion, right, and then the Habsburg, and then Russia, so you can see that if you're looking at the screenshot here. Um, let's see, among the lands contain, uh, contained a population of Slavs, again, people of Eastern Europe, who share a common ancestry and languages, and now 40% of Prussia is made up of uh, Slavs, right? So that's a big portion of the population. Again, Germans were no strangers to Eastern Europe, in fact, a part of the region. Analysts and intro, we can go to that portion next. It was under this pretext that we look to understand the radical ideals um, that developed about Eastern Europeans or Slavs in Nazi Germany and to perhaps understand the historical development of these ideals. Chief among the, uh, these is the ideal of Eastern Europeans as racial inferiors. Okay, so you know, um, we'll probably get to some propaganda here. Uh, I don't have as many images as the last one here, but. Um, See if I can find. We will get to it. And there's a good one there. We can look at that in a second. While I have limited myself to a neutral assessment of the contact of Germany with Eastern Europe using facts about this co contact, I'm about to narrow to the racial ideals of Russians and Slavs and Germany dating back as far as I can. I should also note that the following is not an effort to stereotype the views of current Germans or even historical Germans, but rather an assessment of where perhaps the historical basis of Nazi ideals came from. Okay, so the next part is barbarians and Slavs. So often were the Slavic peoples associated with um, Right? The 
So, so often were the people of Eastern Europe associated <coughs> with slavery, the word for slave comes from the Slav people. The name Slavic means captive, and in other words, Slavic people means captive people. As OxfordDictionary.com notes of the origin, I think it's slave. Let me just check it out. I'm looking. I want everyone to see it when I do it. Let's see, if you look at the definition of slave under Merriam-Webster, you get what I was exactly reading you. It says here, from the frequent enslavement of Slavs in Central Europe during the early Middle Ages, right? Sometimes you can go a little further down. I'm not sure if this is the one I got it from. Maybe I got. Maybe I typed in Slavic people, but anyway, uh, OxfordDictionaries.com notes of the origins: um, South Slav Slavic people, South um, some South Slavic peoples had been reduced to a servile state by the conquest in the 9th century. So that's Oxford Dictionary. And we just showed you on Merriam-Webster. We have a similar uh, origin of the word. Let's go a little more down here. If we can. Alright. So the... Alright, if we go down to the origin of slave, we see, again... Right? From the frequent enslavement of Slavs in Central uh, Europe during the Middle Ages. So we know that. We also know that in the Oxford de definition. In 1266, Genoa, a economic uh, trading power and rival of the Republic of Venice, you know what? Let's pull up a map of uh, Italy since we got it. Okay? Right. Okay. So this is actually a really good map. You could pull, uh, you could I go Italy and um, Italy. I'm trying to think. Is this an Italian one? Ooh, yeah. You could type away Italy in the 12th and 13th century, right? And you would get a lot of the similar things. I'm not seeing what we're looking for though on this map. Uh, But you can see Venice here. I don't know where um, Genoa was supposed to be somewhere. I could find it. It's northern Italy, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Genoa is right here. Um, I think this is the Republic of Genoa. See if we can find a better map. Right, so Genoa, which is right here. Okay, and then you have Venice, which is here, another trading partner. Both, so basically, in 12, uh, yeah, so you have in 1266, Genoa, tra economic trading power and rival of the Republic of Venice, um, arrived in southern Russia. So we can note that when we get to it. Okay, so they're trading partners, and so, you know, either Genoa or Venice. If you can look at the map, you can always look up the, both of those on um, your own, or you can just follow along and listen. Um, well, okay, so you, we noted that point there. Um, from their trading base in Kappa, which I can look up, I think I spelled that right. Let me make sure I got it right. No, there's not. I typed in. Okay, we're going to go back a little bit. Sorry. All right. 
this. So if you look at CAFO, so they had from their base, uh, their trading base, and why did it keep going to? I wanted not maps. I wanted them clicking maps instead of images. All right. So this is what it looks like. And that's today on the uh, Crimean Peninsula. And Theodosia is another place they called it. And yeah, so you can see it was a very big map. You can see the Genoese uh, colonies and the Connacht, which is uh, this is this area here. Uh, that is basically the descendants of the Mongolians, who are the Tartars in this region, part of the Golden Horde. So many people don't know this. The Golden Horde was made up of actually uh, Turkic peoples, Mongolians, and what we know as some of the Tartar people today. So there's not exactly... Um, right, so you can see where we're looking at, Kaffa, on the Crimean Peninsula. It used to be part of Ukraine, but apparently it's part of Russia now. Um, you know, that's sort of <laughs> where we have find ourselves. Uh, right from their base in Kaffa in modern-day Crimea, the Genoese transported slaves from the Ukraine. As John Kelly wrote in his book, The Great Mortality of the Slave Trade in Eastern Europe, the slave markets of the Levant, which is primarily the Mediterranean coast of what is Israel, sort of Syria, Lebanon, that kind of area, that's what the Levant was, where big bum blonde Ukrainians fetch a handsome price at auctions. While this does not provide a view of how Germans viewed their Slavic neighbors, it did provide us a look at poor treatment of others in Europe. So, from these bases here, at Kappa, and they would get slaves from the Ukraine. You can look up a map if you'd like. And I guess see if I can pull up a, a map of the Levant. I'm not really sure. I've never actually looked at the boundaries. I just know, kind of know what it is. Let's see if I can find a good picture. Yeah, it's roughly, you know, what I would describe it as, because you're not going to get any, a decent image that to me doesn't make any sense. I mean, as far as, like, you know, giving you a, a, a real particular uh, place, but just know that it's, it's primarily the coast of Israel, um, Lebanon, and, and uh, jo uh, Jordan. Well, Jordan doesn't have a coast. But um, <clears throat> uh, Lebanon, Syria, and, uh, and Israel, modern-day Israel today. <clears throat> The German view of Eastern Europeans as uncivilized must have been rooted in the con conversion of Slavs under King Otto the First. Okay, so we can look at a picture of that. He's the Holy Roman Emperor. So you can see pictures of him being depicted, different pictures. Um, right, so different historical images here. Roughly, the Holy Roman Empire was Germany. It was a loosely fragmented collection of states uh, for mutual defense, primarily. Uh, right, so the German view of Eastern Europeans is, may have been rooted in the conversion of Slavs under King Otto I. Right, after a lengthy conquest of lands under the Slavs, Otto, according to historian Martin Kitchen, the uh, heathen Slavs were forcibly converted. Okay, so there's a religious aspect to this. After, right, we noted that point, while this ha was the um, standard practice of conquering uh, European Christian armies, it may provide a clue to the attitude towards Slavs um, in, the, in the German 10th century. So we noted about the, uh, uh, you know, after lengthy conduct, of lands uh, once under the Slav Otto, according to historian Martin Kitchen, uh, right about you know the conversion of the heathen Slavs, right? Well, this was uh, you know standard practice of conquering European Christian armies. It may provide a clue to the attitude towards Slavs in the 10th century, right? So we're going to look at 
if it has it here. Let's see. Yeah, you can see this looks like it's probably. Oh, it's not right. Yeah, anyway, we can't find a map on this. We'll keep moving along. Um, I should also note that those that converted to Western Catholicism integrated into uh, Europe more fully. The Russians who chose to join the Greek uh, Eastern Orthodox Church never fully became a uh, full part of uh, Europe. And we can actually show you the map of that. You can look it up, Greek Orthodox. Right, so we can track the images here, and this is primarily what it looks like um, in in Europe, right? So you can see <clears throat> Poland is more Catholic, uh, Lithuania, um, right? And you can see where where the dividing line between Greek Orthodoxy um, was, and where you find more uh, Roman Catholicism, right? So, uh, right, so, the, you know, the Russians were never really fully into, so they became a religious component of the divide of Europe. And you can look at a map of, uh, you know, map of uh, Greek Orthodox, and you'll, you'll find some interesting stuff there. Right, so the ones that chose Catholicism, like Poland and Lithuania, were more integrated into Europe. Um, this may provide evidence of an outsider view of Russians and Orthodox Christians of Eastern Europe. Right, so... You don't, you don't really get the same status as, you know, uh, people in Greece and Serbia as you would, say, you know, those of Hungary or Poland and so forth and so on. As Hagen Schultz described the divide in Europe, the breakup of the empire affected the Christian church as well. Eastern Orthodoxy split off from the Latin uh, Christianity of the West, adding a religious uh, dimension to the political partition of Europe. This was the starting point of a long-lasting political, religious, and ideological division of the Western world. Two distinctively different civilizations arose on Eastern European soil, experiencing friction in their repeated contacts with, without, uh, without one ever succeeding in permanently absorbing the other. Rome and Byzantine, Rome, Roman Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, Eastern, Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Church, the liberal west and the slovile east. So this map really is not just about religion, it's also about the political divide, right? If you look at the map, you can kind of see what people will call the west, right? If you're looking at the Catholic nations. If you're looking at the Orthodox nations, you're, you're, you're just seeing like what they would call the slovile east. There are two things contained in this statement. One, a religious divide that separated western and eastern Europe, and a view of the people of the people of uh, Eastern Europe. When Schultz referred to the liberal West and the Slovile East, he brought up a racial component of the view of the East as Slovile. Slovophile, I guess would be the correct term. Meanwhile, the West uh, viewed itself as a bastion of democracy and enlightened. Their lack of progress, were, uh, you know, the lack of progress in the East was caused um, some cause some to think it was because they were the Slovile East. So that brings us to modern German nation and radical, uh, you know, radical Russian biases or biases. In the 1870s, Germany became a nation along the lines of military conflicts with its neighbors, right? Some people call those the unification wars, right? So if you look at it, right, you see a lot of, um, this one's not a good one, but so, you know, Germany becomes a new nation. This is pretty much what it looks like. Right? I mean, this part's not exactly right, though. Um...
Let's see if this is it right here. So you, this is what you sort of have in you know the lighter part of these fragmented Germany, right? Um, if you look at it, you got these areas. This is you know Prussia, uh, united in 1866 to 1867 as the Northern German Confederation. So all the purple, and then all the dark color here is the Northern German Confederation. You can look at a map if you'd like. Just know that uh, Germany was fragmented, united in 1871, which is this. You know, like the purple field can't the map. Um, right. And then parts annexed from France, right? So you see a, a lot of warfare made the country. And that's just important to note, um, you know, the nature of the nation there. In the 1870s, Germany became a nation along the lines of, uh, along the lines of conflict with its neighbors like France and Denmark and Austria. Right, so the last part you can point to, you know, these annexations in Lorraine and Alsace, um, and then parts of uh, Denmark were taken, and um, other parts was just really to get, you know, Austria-Hungary to submit in certain ways. So you can see that there on the map. You can see where what Germany looks like. You know, uh, basically Germany looks like this. Uh, I'll trace it with the uh, um, with the uh, my mouse all the way up there and around here and all the way around here that is Germany and you can look at a map of Germany in 1871 if you'd like to see that um, in the lead up to war right um, though Germany continued to downplay the legitimate legitimacy of their um, you know of the of the untaunt power of Russia as a military threat right this is before World War one as one Baltic historian wrote in 1913, Russia is, of the whole, weak in times of, of war because its military leadership is corrupt and its and the soldiers for the most uh, most highly placed officer to the new recruit can be corrupted. Okay? So that's something to just think about there. Um... You know the view in the German in Germany of of, of its um, you know future enemy. Right? right. So you can see that the images that it portrays of its enemy, the future enemies. Um, okay. This statement provides us with a look into how the government of uh, Russia was viewed. Critics pointed to the flaws in the Russian state and society or culture as to why Russia was not a threat. So Russia was downplayed, right? Um, Russia was downplayed, right, because of its... Um, you know, because of what it saw as the Slovile East. I mean, if you look at this Europe in 1914 propaganda cartoon, um, you might see you know, this image I'm looking at here. Again, if you don't want to look, you won't be able to see all the stuff I'm talking about here, but you can always look things up. And you can see some of the characterizations of the uh, Russians by the Germans, right? So that's just something to think about, um, you know. What you know, how the Russians were viewed uh, throughout the you know, period up to war, and then further into the war, right? So they pointed to critics pointed to the flaws in the Russian state and society, or culture, as to why Russia was not a threat. So Russia was not just you know a, a government that was just kind of gone wrong. It was the culture of Russia, right? That made these types of governments. The Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 and the Russian Revolution of 1905 only emboldened these claims. The Russians also view, were viewed as the Asiatic and backwards power. They had, um, as historian Mark Hewitson notes of the views of Russians by writing, like other academic public publicists such as Max Lenz, Mox Lenz, Schiemann, or, um, Schiemann emphasize the internal flaws of nationalities which look to undermine Russian expansion in the future. Right, so it's a 
bunch of different nationalities inside of Russia. It's not just, you know, uh, Russian people. It's just sort of a collection of peoples, you know, and these flaws of these uh, nationalities as they expand, right? The, uh, that's going to lead to the downfall. So, like other academic public publicists, such as Max, Max Lanz, and Schliemann, um, emphasize the internal flaws of nationalities, which look to undermine Russian expansion of the future. So, Russia was flawed, uh, uh, and therefore it would, it would fail. While not clear if it was um, widespread views inside Germany, a certain segment of German academics viewed Russia, Russians in particular, as barbarians and backwards. Okay? So we can definitely note that. So these are things we can note. Right? Um... I mean, there's uh, some pretty, that's Nazi propaganda. Uh, right, so we'll, we'll get to the Nazi part of this later on. Um, right, as Hewitson noted on the German views of Russians, Russia was threatened as a culturally and sometimes a racially inferior power was treated, sorry, Russia was treated as a cultural, uh, culturally and sometimes racial inferior power, and that's from Mark Hewitson, German historian there. Um, as Hewitson notes on the cause of, the, of this, a lack of knowledge of Russians was pre, uh, present inside Germany, and that adds to Schultz's argument of a divided a divide in Europe, as the states, uh, as he states, this was starting point of a long-lasting political, religious, and ideological division of the Western world, right? So, this gives, uh, you know, further credence to uh, Schultz's statement, this was the starting point of a long-lasting political, religious, and ideological division of the Western world. So, you really can't really talk about, um, you know, the nation as something divided. Um, right, so we're talking about Liebenstrom, right? And that's going into the Nazi state. In 1933, the Nazis took absolute power in, in, in the Enabling Act. There was but only, uh, there was but one party, and at this time, the head was Adolf Hitler. In 1935, Jews were denied citizenship rights. The march to the Holocaust had began. These facts are common to the observers of the Nazi state, but what of the policy towards Eastern Europeans and their uh, connection to German racial ideology against Slavs? Well, writing on the, uh, you know, the, of the, you know, desires of Hitler that went under the radar to most Germans, German historian Hagen Schultz wrote, from his first day as chancellor, the, he wanted war, through which he intended not only to reverse the Treaty of Versailles, but to expand the borders of Germany and establish world dominance for the Aryan race. So again, racial ideology is at the key of this. At the heart of the Nazi state was radical idea uh, was racial ideology and supremacy of the race, uh, meaning conquest of new lands. And this goes into the Liebenstrom, uh, Liebenstrom comment, and we're going to get into that. These new lands would come from Eastern Europe. Hitler admitted conquests of new Liebenstrom in the East and its ruthless Germanization. So in the East, Eastern Europe, and uh, Liebenstrom, right, expansion of land or living space. Liebenstrom was an ideal that was... Uh, was that the German people needed living space, or as Merriam-Webster wrote, territory believed, especially by Nazis, to be necessary for national existence or economic self-efficiency. The first of these moves, uh, in the vein of uh, Liebenstrom, came from Czechoslovakia. Hitler planned to take Czechoslovakia in October 1938. The Allies on uh, the Allies and Munich, on September 29th, accepted the German annexation of the Sudetenland, or 
the far western area of Czechoslovakia, which had a large population of German speakers. This agreement by Britain and France was said to allow to avoid war. And we can look up the Sudetenland. Yes, I did. All right, so let me just show an image of that state land. All right, so you can see a lot of this outside if you're looking at the map. If not, just bear with me. Just remember, it's the most western part of the uh, of uh, <clears throat> of uh, Czechoslovakia, and you can see around here. This, and this is Czechoslovakia. Right? And here is a map of some other things. Czech territory given to Hungary by Germany, right? So you can see the Czechoslovakian nation in the Sudetenland, like I said, the most western part of uh, what is today Czechoslovakia. Or the Czech Republic today, even further. Okay? And so, you know, they were the far more supposed to to Czechoslovakia, which had a lot of This was an agreement by Britain and France was said to avoid war. The so-called British-German agreement was also part of the, uh, these discussions, which supposedly was a uh, commitment to avoid war by both parties. The ideal in the West was that moves allowed by Hitler in Czechoslovakia, again, this, you know, region of the Sudetenland in the western part of Czechoslovakia, uh, would be done, you know, uh, you know, would by, would be done with, you know, he, Hitler would be done by um, being allowed to have some territory, right? That would satisfy him. Um, war and in the East, right? War in the East. The Allies could not be more wrong as Hitler in 1939 took all of Czechoslovakia and began movement into the in, into Poland, building his empire by Eastern Europe. So Hitler moves into you know Eastern Europe. All right, we'll just look up a territory. Uh, 1942, I guess, is a good year for the at least for, that's what Google says. Um, See if this map expands. All right, so you can see where most of the territory is, right? The Allies could not be more wrong. Siddler in 1939 took all of Czechoslovakia and began um, movement into Poland, building the uh, building empire in Eastern Europe. And you can see in 1942, most of the territory, again, is in Eastern Europe, which approximately begins probably you know, around, you know, around the German border with Poland and, you know, parts of the, uh, Czechoslovakia. Right. So the history of the Western War has been well documented in terms of the invasion of France and the subsequent liberation, but the Nazi movement in the East is less understood. Despite the strategic reasoning that, that Germany should defeat Britain before moving uh, before war with the Soviet Union, Hitler turned his eyes to the Soviet Union. The invasion of the Soviet Union went or uh, <clears throat> went ahead on June 22, 1941. Despite the military uh, sense to uh, despite the you know military you know, the more uh, military-minded to finish off Britain, really. Yet why did Hitler and the Nazis shift their attack when militarily it made sense to finish off Britain? The, uh, the answer to this question plays into the next topic, Nazi racial, racial ideology is the next topic. Before addressing the uh, previous question, it is necessary to first um, first work out the uh, you know the Nazi priorities, right? Hitler had committed to the war for expansion in the East, 
and not the West. Again, we're just talking about you know Germany. You can you know you can see if I'm pointing here, and you can see most of the territory is in the east, roughly. This is the east. You can look up a map of German Europe 1942 German domination, and you'll see what I'm looking at here if you're listening to the podcast. And you can roughly see just how much of this territory is controlled by the Germans, right? So that's just an important thing to note. Um, the ultimate goal remained conquest of the East, and everything uh, uh, else was a sideshow. So going back to the question, why move East when strategically it made sense to finish Britain? The answer is despite its surface claims, to conquest in the east, which no doubt uh, meant the suppression of Western Europe, the Nazis' aims were motivated by racial ideology. Right? The so racial ideology uh, of not just Jews, but Eastern Europeans. When motivated by ideology and fanaticism, the, I, the realities are blurred and the goals of the ideology become uh, supreme. Given that Poland is, is, the, is the largest and earliest of the Nazi conquests east, we shall turn there first. We can get to another... Right? So we'll turn to Poland first. First we will contrast, as Kagan Schultz does, the Nazi occupation of Western Europe. Yeah, I'm sorry, Hagen Schultz. Or maybe it is King. Yeah, Hagen Schultz. Uh, with, you know, the Nazi occupation of Western Europe and the East. Right? There's important distinctions there. Oh, that's, that's a picture. Um, Schultz says that in Western Europe, the invading army largely acted as a traditional force, right? As Hagen Schultz points out on the East, though, in the East, the SS left the population in no doubt at all about what it could expect in the event of a German victory. Poland offered an opportunity to convert racist ideology into deeds. So, it was no longer about ideology, right? It was about the actual practice of, um, you know, what they could do. Right? You know, they're gonna actually going to do bad things. It's no longer about, you know, ideology. And you can see that. A lot of shocking images I'm going through right now. You know. And these are primarily probably in Poland, if I had to guess. Polish aristocrats were killed along with millions of Jews. This is in Poland alone, right? Poland has the largest um, amount of death camps in there. The SS, the most uh, vile and racist organization of, the Nazi Ger of Nazi Germany, was carrying out the occupation in the East, and deaths and murder would follow. So their ideology was being you know, put into practice here, right? The violence and death carried out in the East was an extension... <coughs> of German racial ideology dating back to the Middle Ages. As Schultz wrote on the ease of this ideology allowed for killing um, yeah, right, so as Schultz wrote on the ease, this killing was allowed, uh, this ideology allowed for the killing versus where it did not occur in the West Quote, behind the German lines, the Wehr Wehrmacht not only resorted to tactics prohibited by international co conventions for more off, uh, far more often than it did in the West, it also had support of the security service. The latter exec executed uh, Soviet political um, commissars 
without any pretense of war formalities, and systematically hunted down Jews. Russian prisoner of prisoners of war were crammed into camps where conditions were designed to give the vast majority no chance of survival. The Nazis had planned to make their empire on Eastern Europe. Slavs were racial inferiors who would serve, act as slaves. The true nature of the war is now revealed. Not to control Western Europe, but dominion over Eastern Europe. Right? So Western Europe was just something they needed to take care of. Um, and that they did, you know. So they, they really did that. You know, you can look at Nazi propaganda. What you'll find is a lot of, uh, you see, uh, things of the Soviet Union, and so forth and so on. And so, you know, there's just a lot of stuff going on in the state itself. But that doesn't stop, you know, here or anywhere, for that matter. If you look at the Nazi images, you know, you can look at them. And you're seeing a different kind of picture. You're seeing uh, Jews being associated with, um, you know, with the Soviet Union. You're seeing uh, pictures of uh, all kinds of, you know, pictures of like, uh, you know, German bayonets going through uh, hands with, you know, the with claws that have the Soviet sickle and hammer on them, and so forth and so on. So you can really see where that racial ideology is playing out. <clears throat> the Nazis had planned to make their empire on Eastern Europe, Slavs of racial period, who were thought, uh, you know, who would act as slaves. The true nature of the war is now revealed, not to control Western Europe, but dominion over Eastern Europe. So we can kind of see that, you know, things going there. But why did the Nazi government attack France? Historian Hagen Scholz makes the following point. The invasion of France was intended to eliminate the danger of attack from the rear, as were, as were Hitler's efforts to reach accommodation with Great Britain by dividing up the world. As an undergraduate student taking a Nazi Germany course, we read a book called The Racial State. And in many ways, Nazi Germany was a racial state was ultimately a racial state, right? Let's see if I can find that book. I no longer have the book itself. Let's see. I think this is the right one. This may not be it. I don't think that was the one. Yeah, I think it was this one. We read this one as a undergraduate. And it really goes into detail. I, don't, I no longer have the book, but it's certainly a good book to, you know, get in the mind of, you know, the racial state and, and you know, how much about race uh, Nazi Germany was, and how little it was about, you know, these quoted things about expansion, right? So, you know, you can just see that there. That's a pretty good book if you'd like to learn on it. Germany and the so-called German race were part of the great Western peoples, while the East was full of racial um, undesirables who should um, be who should give way to the superior German or Aryan race in the, in the East. Right? So the German people were superior, and they were, they were going to come to dominate their proper place um, in the East. Right? Over these unsuperior people. Conclusion section. That these ideals did not start with the Nazis. These were ideals that dated back to the German expansion into Slavic lands in the Middle Ages. There remained a push and pull in Eastern Europe between Slavic peoples and Germans for quite some time, till in the 18th century when Russia, Austria, and Prussia divided up Poland. Yet even with Slavic people filling up a big portion of the German uh, state's land, of the German state's lands, right, Prussia, 
cultural and racial components of Slavic and Eastern European peoples would make their way into the new German state. In the lead-up to the war in 1914, Germany downplayed the efficiency of its, uh, of its potential enemy, Russia, by saying it was too backwards and crooked to be taken seriously. These ideals carried over into the Nazi state when a radical faction of many competing factions in Germany took power. Of course, we, now, we know them as the Nazis, whose radical ideals of the Slavic and Eastern Europeans allowed for much destruction. The Nazis did not come up with these ideals on their own. These were ideals that were, had been present for some time. I will also make clear this by no means is an indictment of the German people, but merely a faction that took power in Germany that existed from 1933 to 1945. As we should not blame the Polish people for death camps on their soil, or the mass shootings in the Ukrainian capital of Kiev, the largest extent of blame, as all blame is in degrees, can be placed on the German Nazi state and its leadership and the true believers. In 1951, Eric Hoffer wrote The True Believer. Right? This book here. Published The True Believer, Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements. As you may, conclu as you may conclude, I took this term, The True Believer, from Hoffer's book. Writing on the power of the true believer of, of, of a mass movement like Nazism, quote, the true believer is everything on the on the march. Sorry, the true believer is everywhere on the march, and both by converting and antagonizing, he is shaping the world in his image. The time the true believer shapes the movement and blinds. <clears throat> sorry, the true believer shapes the movement and builds his or her followers and and this lies the ultimate and his or her ultimate doctrine right so the true believer ultimately is a person who believes the doctrine to the core and uh, it is their doctrine that, that is is the one that people convert to the true believer um, you know this is what Hawker says anyway Right, the true believer uh, is, is converted to uh, the true believer is converted to the uh, ever, the true believer converts the people to his ideology or, or, or her ideology, uh, right? So the movement and blinds his or her followers into the lies of the ultimate uh, doctrine. So there, there's never there's always a core followers, but there's a lot of people that are loosely following the movement for uh, you know less than clear motives or for you know one thing or the other but never the, for the full doctrine so that's the big difference here anyways uh, this is James signing off and saying good luck